Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video today, we're going to be talking about hypovolemic shock. So if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and comment down below, and don't forget to subscribe. And then head over to ninjanerd.org. It's where we have all of our notes and illustrations for all the lectures that we put up here on YouTube. But let's get started here with hypovolemic shock. So what are we going to be talking about with hypovolemic shock? You should already be thinking this is a decrease in circulating volume, meaning the amount of volume that we have in our body is going to be depleted. And it can be broken into two different categories. What we're looking at here is hemorrhagic, or non-hemorrhagic, or a loss of blood for one of the causes, or a loss of fluid for one of the causes. So what we're gonna be talking about here is what are some potential hemorrhagic causes that we can experience hypovolemic shock? Well, one of those right away, when we think about hemorrhagic, we can think about right here, this lady being pregnant, and we can think about postpartum. All right, so postpartum hemorrhage. So a, a patient goes in, they go in to have their baby, and then all of a sudden some complications occur. It's one of the more common things with uh, pregnancy. When you go to give birth, you can have postpartum hemorrhage. Another one that we're gonna be looking up here is our upper GI bleed. So we have a patient that maybe has esophageal varices or they have peptic ulcer disease, and they are prone to possibly having a hemorrhagic episode. Right? What are some other areas? What are some things that you can think about with a patient that would come in and have some type of hemorrhage? Let's think about the next one, which would be any type of trauma. Right? So a patient that is going to have some type of potential puncture wound, they're going to have some type of crush injury, or they are have multiple lacerations, they could also have a, a tendency to have a hemorrhagic episode or go into hypovolemic shock. And then there's one more we're going to talk about, and that is an aneurysm, right? So if a patient has an aneurysm in their head, an aneurysm in their abdomen, and they go and they have a ruptured aneurysm, that can also cause them to have hemor uh, hemorrhage or have a hypovolemic shock situation. On the other end of this, we were gonna talk about ones that are non-hemorrhagic, somebody that's not necessarily bleeding out, but they're having some other issues with their fluid, right? So they're having a depletion in their fluid. So easy one to think about right away is, it's so a patient that is vomiting a lot or a patient that's having diarrhea, right? They're losing a lot of fluid that way. On the same scale of this, you can also think somebody's having an issue with peeing or diuresing, so they're peeing a lot or also sweating a lot, right? So all these would be ways that patients are losing fluid. That is not blood, is they're losing all types of fluid from their body. What's another one? We can think about patients that are in the burn unit or burn centers when they're lo losing a lot of that fluid that they would need in their interstitial fluid. So they're losing that, they're having a fluid deficit. And the last one we wanna think about is where patients have third spacing of fluid. So they're having lots of edema, maybe ascites, and the, the fluid that should be intravascular is now interstitial, it's in a place that it shouldn't be. So. When we think about hypovolemic shock, we need to think about how this is going to occur within the body. So either they're going to have hemorrhage, which is a decrease in the blood volume, or we'll have a patient that is decreasing in their fluid volume, right? So we need to think of this pathophysiology. And what we're looking at really here is a decrease in the intravascular fluids, right? So we have a decrease in this intravascular fluid. So because of this, we're going to have a decrease in our preload to the heart, and then thus a decrease in our stroke volume. Because if you remember, or if you forgot, we have cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. And we wanna remember that our stroke volume can be broken into preload, afterload, and our contractility. Okay, so if we have a decrease in our preload, right here, we're gonna have a decrease in our stroke volume. And if we have a decrease in our stroke volume, the next sequence in this would be our decrease in our cardiac output, right? So now our heart isn't gonna be pumping out as much as we want, right? 
So because of that, we have hypovolemic shock, so we should be thinking decreased cardiac output. Because of this hypovolemia, this decrease in volume, we're going to be seeing that manifest as a decrease in our blood pressure, right? And if we think all the way back to basic anatomy and physiology, when we have that decrease in blood pressure, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about decrease in perfusion. Well, what's perfusion? It's bringing our nutrients and our oxygen to all those vital organs. And when we are having a decrease in that perfusion, we're having a decrease in getting that oxygen there, which is causing possibly ischemia. And when we have ischemia, we have damage to those potential organs. So let's move into now that we understand what the pathophysiology is with that decrease in the fluids, causing a decrease in the preload and stroke volume causing a decrease in that cardiac output and then causing our decrease in our blood pressure or our hypotension, what are some of the signs and symptoms that our patients may exhibit if they are having hypovolemic shock or going into it? All right, Ninja Nerds, now let's talk about the signs and symptoms. And when we talk about them today, we're going to be talking generally about hypovolemic shock. But in a separate video, I will go over all the different stages of hypovolemic where it's a little more in depth. But for the purposes of the NCLEX, you don't necessarily have to know all of the stages. You just need to see hypovolemic shock as its whole. But as we go in to talk about the signs and symptoms, we want to initially start with our biggest one, right? Our patient is losing blood or is losing fluid, or maybe they're losing both. Both of those will manifest, like we talked about, that decrease in blood pressure, which is what we call hypotension, right? So if we remember back to anatomy and physiology, when we have a patient who is low blood pressure or hypotension, at some point, they typically want to compensate and have tachycardia. Whoops, tachycardia, right? Their heart rate is going to pick up in order to try to help out with that hypotension because we want to keep trying to perfuse and keep trying to bring blood and oxygen to where it needs to be. That hypotension is occurring because we're having that deficit in our fluid or our volume. Then we're gonna have tachycardia because we're gonna pick up that heart rate to try to increase the cardiac output. What else is going to incur? If we're having an issue delivering oxygen and our body notices that, what is our body gonna do? It's gonna say, breathe, breathe more for me. Please breathe for me. So now we're gonna have maybe tachypnea. So patient's now gonna have an increase in their respiratory rate. So they're gonna have this breathing that's occurring, right? It's going a lot faster. Heart rate's going a lot faster. And because of all this, there's some other things that are be going on with our patient, right? One of the things is we know that they have this decrease in fluid, right? This decrease in volume. So if they start running out of volume, what are some signs and symptoms you might see? Well, they might be telling you, oh, I had diarrhea and vomiting all night. Now I'm just gaggy. I'm just having this dry heave over and over again, but nothing's coming out. Another thing that could go on is they could also have oliguria, meaning they're not perfusing anymore or they're not creating any more urine. They are basically dried up. There's nothing else to come out. With all this being said, they also are having this problem with this perfusion. If they are further along than we think, they might start having some type of altered mental status, right? Maybe there's something else going on. They're not getting perfusion to the brain. The family's gonna say, I don't know, they've been acting a little off. Not quite off too much, but like here and there, they're saying some weird things or they're answering questions funny. So they're gonna be having that altered mental status. And then we're looking at them too, if they're losing blood, what are some of the things that we look at when we see a patient that maybe we're thinking they're having some decrease in blood, right? We see the vital signs are going on, but looking at the patient, just looking at them, what are some things that we might see? Well, we might see that they look pale, right? Their skin's going to be looking pale, and the, the lips or the gums or the, the eye, everything's looking a little more pale. We can also think about are they looking sweaty or clammy, right? What is Another sign, just looking at a patient that you're like, mm, something might be going on. I think this patient is going into hypovolemic shock or is getting really, really close to being hypovolemic. And they might be really anxious. And again, that's that driving force between that decrease in oxygen. So we have some general signs and symptoms that we're looking at our patient. We're like, mm, their blood pressure's low. They're acting kind of funny. They're looking a little pale. Um, but there really is maybe no signs of bleeding, and you want to think back to maybe it's something GI related. Are they having difficulty with stools? Are the stools been dark and now all of a sudden they're not dark? Questions like that. So we move into maybe getting some blood work, and we see that there is indications that this patient is losing blood. Maybe we do a stool occult and check down below, and we see that there is positive for blood down there. When we are looking at a patient that is indeed having a hemorrhagic type of shock, we want to start thinking about what we need to do to get those volumes back up. So if they lost blood, what are we gonna do? We're gonna be giving this patient blood, right? We're gonna transfuse, transfuse blood. 
In order to give them blood, we want to think about our RBCs, our red blood cells. They might get fresh frozen plasma, and they might even need some platelets. Okay, so what do we need possibly before? If it's going to be unmatched, un uncross unmatched, we're typically giving them O negative, but we do want to look into that type and screen. Right, making sure we're checking what their blood type is. We're going to be seeing if the CBC levels look like so that we can get an idea on how this patient is doing. We also want to be making sure that we're looking into what's going on with them. So we need to make sure that we are talking to our, um, our team and letting them know, hey, I'm going to be transfusing blood in here. I need somebody else with me. And we also want to talk to them about what's going on. So we need, we're going to need that two nurse verification right so now we have two nurse verification for this blood transfusion that's one thing that we can be doing along with other medications but the biggest thing with the hemorrhagic is giving them blood on the non hemorrhagic side we're going to be focusing on giving them the fluid back right so our patient is going to get some fluid normal saline or lactated ringers right what else is this patient possibly going to get? They are also, along with our hemorrhagic, might get some vasopressors, right, to help bring up that blood pressure by uh, com constricting, there we go, the blood vessels. What are some other things that we can do for this patient? You want to think about what we're going to be looking at for them. How do we know that their fluid volume is starting to come back? What are some of the other nursing interventions we can be looking at? Well, we are going to be doing INO, right? So you remember. What is the output the patient should be having? The patient should be having 30 milliliters per hour. That's how we know we, our kidneys are working at the way they should. So if we're going to be monitoring this, what are they going to need for this? A urinary catheter. OK. What else do we want to do? We want to make sure that we have them with on vasopressors. They're going to be getting fluids. So what are some other things? Maybe it is a GI bleed. So right now they might have to be on NPO, right? This patient is going to need vital signs. How often? Maybe Q 15 minutes for a while in order that we're able to keep an eye on what their vital signs are doing. And we're going to be doing neurostatuses, right? Checking on that neurostatus. If they were altered in the beginning, how are we going to be able to tell that this patient is getting better? But when we are doing this, we want to start thinking about other things. If we're doing vasopressors and we're checking the fluid output because we're giving them fluid, we're checking their blood pressure, what are some other ways that we're going to be able to tell if the vasopressors are working? I want you to think about perfusion. Right? If they are perfusing correctly, we should be seeing a cap refill. That is going to be less than three seconds, right? We're going to be thinking about what does their neurostatus change look like. If they're perfusing correctly, what else is going to look better? Their color, right? What is their skin looking like? So we're able to keep an eye on them. And then when we do all this, what is the biggest thing we want to think about in nursing, like the basics of nursing? We're thinking about all the interventions we can do, but what's one that's just super easy when they're in bed? We want to think about the positioning. So the head of bed should be less than 30 degrees. We want to think about Trendelenburg or elevated legs. In order to get that perfusion back to the heart, back to the brain. Okay. So I hope this made sense, Ninja Nerds. I hope you're able to focus on what the differences are between the hemorrhagic and the non-hemorrhagic, and how even though a patient might be fluid hemorrhagic, might be missing blood, they also still might need a vasopressor. They still also might need fluids as well as getting the blood back so that we're able to keep perfusion correctly up and keep those vital signs stable enough so the patient can recover. And then, of course, with the hemorrhagic, the one other thing I forgot to say is where, what's the cause? We need to find the cause of this bleed. So we need to figure out, are they having a bleed that we can surgically repair, that we need to surgically repair, or is there something else going on that we can just do by rest in the GI maybe, or is it something that is traumatic and we need to go in and, and fix it right now without even setting up surgery. It is now considered trauma related and we have to do it very, very quick. 
So I hope that all made sense, Ninja, Her Ninja Nerds. I hope that you learned something from this. And as always, until next time.